invite you, if you are able, to stand with us as we sing. Come into your presence. Moses had seven mountaintop meetings with God. 
God wanted to show both Moses and the people that there is no bigger deal in life than meeting with God. We can learn from this, how can we meet with God every day? We do not have to make appointments or wait in line, and God will give us his undivided attention. If you're too busy to meet with the Lord, you're way too busy. Our number one priority every day should be make time for the Lord. We can't go where we need to go in life if we do not take God with us. Let us pray. Father, we come before you now asking you to open our hearts and our minds. Prepare us to listen to the message that's going to be coming our way. We pray that you will direct our thoughts and our ever being. These things we ask in your son's holy name. Amen. <coughs> this song has come to mean a lot to me and many other people. I invite you if you're able to stand with us as we sing an amazing grace my chains are gone.
Again, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. For some of you who are new to the church, uh, our, our speaker is Jimmy Spindell. He's been here before, and he's had a great sermon all, every time he's been here. And uh, so, Jimmy, at this time, if you want to come and, and, and give us the sermon that God has laid up on your heart.
as there was a crowd in the place. <coughs> Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. This man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Father, within this passage, you have uh, prepared a message for me, Father. Father, I have studied, I have prepared, and uh, I am just uh, putting all my trust and faith in you, God. I'm just turning it over to you, uh, God, and I just pray for uh, uh, today, God, that uh, somebody here just needs to hear what you have to say, Father. Father, that I would just uh, fully trust in what you're going to speak. And God, as you use me, I'm just uh, I'm just humble here, Father, to get to be just standing up here in front of these people, to speak your word, to uh, just bring out what is true and, and what is uh, what is valid, Father. So God, just uh, be with us today and just fill your house with this presence. Uh, may your spirit just move within us. Uh, may your spirit work in me today, Father. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So afterwards, Jesus, uh, you know, it says after there was a faith, there was a feast, and we don't know what feast this is. Uh, we don't know if it's uh, um, uh, which feast it is, the unleavened bread or the festival of sheaves or, or or which one it is. We just know that Jesus is at a feast, and uh, he was at a special place, uh, a place where uh, <clears throat> these pools. I, you know, in this passage. It's kind of interesting because uh, a lot of people didn't believe that this really even took place because they could not find these pools. And, uh, and about 100 years ago, or the late 1800s, they, uh, they actually found these pools. They, they, they dug them, they found part of them. And then later on in the 1900s, they actually started excavating them and really finding what this passage really says. The, the two pools, the five colonnades, these pools are like 300 feet long and 100 and some feet wide, and, and, and they say up to uh, about 30 feet deep. So this is quite a deal, and it, and it was right next to St. Anne Church where they found this at. Now, back in the time of Jesus, it was just right outside the north wall of the temple. So the sheep gate, they believed, was for, uh, they would bring the sheep in, they would clean the sheep, and they would get them ready for a sacrifice. Um, and now as you read down through your Bible, it, uh, Yours might not have verse 4 in it. Mine don't have verse 4 in it. it, has, it and it don't have part of verse 3. Uh, now the King James, uh, the NASB, the New King James has that. Um, but I do have what it says. I think I do. Yeah. And it says, uh, For an angel of the Lord went down at a certain season into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. So, so why is it not in here, you might wonder? Well, they have found newer manuscripts. You know, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this wasn't in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and the ESV is a newer translation. It's a word-for-word -word translation. Uh, they, they say that it's probably one of the most purest translations behind the NSAB. But well, why was it in the King James, you might say? Well, you ever write a note beside your, in your margin? I mean, mine's just covered. If you could just see it, I got notes all over in my margins. And some scribe or something might have wrote a little margin in, in the margin there, and they might have just inserted it into the King James Version. So that's why it's there. Now, I don't think it's a big deal. But however, I do believe that uh, I don't think God heals this way. Um, you know, how sad would it be to say to somebody, I'll heal you, but you got to be the first one there. You, you can only be healed when the water is stirred. You can only be healed when this angel is there. Well, that's not the way God works, is it? God doesn't put a, a time or, or a table or anything like that in our lives of when we when we can come to Him, when we can be in His presence, or anything like that. So I just that's just kind of me. Uh, 
Now that's Jimmy speaking. Um, you can take that with a, with a grain of salt. But, but in this pool it says it, there are laid a multitude of people. That, uh, from what I was reading, it could be up to 3,000 people laying in there. Blind, sick, lame, diseased, whatever it is, but just let your imagination move there, you know, and just think of how, what a sight this would be, you know. Uh, people couldn't go in there because they were unclean. Um, but here comes Jesus. And he seeks out this one guy, this one guy that has been there for 38 years. Um, you know, if that doesn't tell us that we're chosen, I, I mean, I definitely believe that we are chosen. I believe in predestination. The Bible tells us in Ephesians that we all are predestined. You know, he offers us the gift, but we have to receive it, right? That tells us that in Romans 6.23. So... He goes to see this man, he chooses this man, and he comes up to him and he says, uh, Sir, would you like to be healed? Now, a lot of us might be thinking, well, what kind of question is that? Why would you ask a man that's laying there sick, paralyzed, would you like to be healed? Um, this guy doesn't even know Jesus, because we, we, we've seen that in the passage. And Jesus just walks to him and says, do you want to be healed? And the guy says, well, I have no way to put me in the water. I've laid here. Um, I'm waiting for somebody. Somebody always gets in there before me. You know, something always goes wrong. Something always goes wrong. And, and, you know, what it tells me is this guy just has no hope. His hope is absolutely gone. He has no hope in anybody taking him, him getting there, or, or anything. It's, he just, uh, he's run out of options. What he is doing is not currently working, right? Just laying there, waiting and waiting. And Jesus tells this man to get up, take up your bed and walk. And in an instant, this man is healed and he walks. And then here's where the Jewish leaders come into place, guys. When they say Jewish leaders, they mean the Pharisees, the religious <coughs> leaders. And they stop this man and they say, it is unlawful for you to carry your bed on a Saturday, on a Sabbath. I mean, well, it was Saturday back then. They don't even notice that he's been healed. They could care less. It's the legalism in their minds, guys. It's the legalism of the law that God made not to work on the Sabbath, which was only a law not to do your regular work. They had changed this law. They had added things to it. Um, somebody, some, some call that the Mishnah, the verbal law that they, they come up with from the Torah. And their law was, had gone so far that I even heard that you could, they couldn't look in the mirror on the Sabbath because they might find a gray hair and want to pull it. Uh, in Israel, I think it was in 1992, they had a fire in an apartment complex. And the guy called the, or went to the priest and said, uh, or the, yeah, the, and he said, uh, what shall we do? Can we call the fire department? Because it's the Sabbath. And the 30 minutes that he took to finally decide whether they could call, it burned three apartment complexes down. So it, it was just their, their rap, I'm trying to think of this word, the rabbi way of they, they've changed this law, the messianic, how they changed it, and they added to it. And it was a form of legalism, guys. Legalism is, Believing, holding on to the law, not, believe, not, not holding on to grace and mercy that Christ gave us. And that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. You know, why, why is it that you do a certain thing in this church? Why do you guys do your service this way or, or that way? Have you ever just stopped and thought about that? Well, well why do we sing four songs? Well, why do we sing a song at the end? Well, it's because we've always done it that way, right? It's, it's because that's how we do it. Um, you guys got a big task coming up in front of you, don't you? You guys are looking for a pastor, right? Now, what God was speaking to me about today was how you guys go about doing this. Um, don't get caught up in the legalistic side of it, the religion side of it. Don't call a pastor here just because 
he's went to school, he's done this, or he's done that. You guys remember when God called David? What was it that he said? I'm going to read that to you, because I feel like this is very important um, in what's, what's going on in this church. I studied David for quite a while, and I found that, that David is a, a wonderful man, but he had a lot of flaws. What, what comes to your mind when you think of David? Let's, let's hear something. Faithful. Huh? Faithful. Faithful. What else? Giant slayer. What else? Adultery. What else? Anybody? There you go. A man after God's own heart. And this is what's, what God told uh, Samuel. He said, go anoint. I have chosen somebody for you to anoint. And in 1 Samuel 16, 6, it says, When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed one is before me. Now this is uh, David's brother, the, first, the very first one that he looks at. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The heart of the man. Because if you have studied David or know what David had done in his life, and you just sit and think, how can this man have a heart after God, the things that he's done? Ask yourself that. Have you ever just asked yourself that? How can I have a heart? after God and the things that I did in my life. That's because we're covered by His grace, right? Because God loves us so much. And when we accept Him, He forgets about that stuff. As far as it is from the east to the west, right? He says to lay it down and forget about it. And this man that was laying on this mat for 38 years, Why didn't he just say when, when Jesus said, pick up your mat and walk? Why didn't he just say, I don't want to pick up that mat anymore. I'm sick and tired of laying on that mat. I laid on that mat for 38 years, and I'm sick and tired of it. I don't want to carry it around anymore. You know why? Because he didn't know Jesus. It says there that Right after he picked up his mat, the Jewish leaders asked him, who said you can pick up your mat? And he's like, I don't know, the guy who healed me. He did not even know him. But that's where Jesus comes back. Verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well and sin no more. It was Jesus' call to repentance, guys. Jesus healed this man, fell back into the crowd, and then he comes back. Why? For the most important thing. He wants to spend eternity with that man. He wants to spend... That man was on that mat 38 years, and Jesus said, you want to know what's worse than that? Go sin more and have about 3,800 years in hell. But no, I'm calling you for... 38 million years with me. To spend eternity to, with me. It's the call to be holy, guys. God calls us to be holy just as He is holy. I believe that's in Leviticus. It's also in 1 Peter. He calls us to be set apart. Just like He called the people of Israel to be set apart. He chose His people to be set apart from everybody else. And to lead an example. To be His example. But they failed at it. Just as we fail every day. We stumble, we fall. We pick that mat back up, right? We pick up that mat, and for some reason we still carry it around with us. And man, it gets pretty heavy, don't it? It gets to be a burden and a load in our life. Um, you know, so why is it that we just can't lay this stuff down? Why is it that we just pick up stuff 
And we just struggle and we carry it and we carry it. You know, is it is it complacency that we pick up and we carry? Maybe it's you've just gotten comfortable. You know, I bet I can come back here next Sunday and you guys will be sitting in the same place, right? <laughs> Pretty comfortable, ain't it? Um, you know, maybe it's maybe it's a habit that you keep going back to. You know, how about uh, your time? Maybe it's doubt you struggle with, fear, unbelief, trust, lust. Golly, maybe it's your work. No, I can't put that down because that's my identity, right? Man, I'm sick and tired of my identity. Because when everybody sees me, they see a carpenter. And I'm just, I told my wife the other day, I'm so tired of being tired. You know, I'm so tired of my identity and being that person. You know, just keeping up that image, that, that image that we think that we have to keep up. You know, Jesus went to the cross, so we don't have to do that. As it says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That wage has to be paid, guys. It's a wage. And that wage of our sin, is, it, it is death. And it's separation. But the gift, the gift is given, but we have to accept it, right? We have to accept it. And in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, 28, I mean Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As he bore those burdens so they could be light for us. You know, his, a yoke is a, a wooden round device that, that yokes two things together, an ox, whatever it is, but it's to do work. It's to put them together so they're equal in there. But his yoke is light, guys. It's not a thing of works. It's just a thing of trusting in him and surrendering to him. You know, I've laid, I've laid a lot of stuff down. And, uh, you know, as I talked about last time when, he's here, when, we, when I was here, that God called Peter away from fishing and he went back to it. And a lot of times we go back to that stuff. And it's not right, guys. When God calls us out of something, He calls us out of something to do something, right? He calls us out of something to be holy, to follow Him, and to trust in Him. Now this man knows, but he still doesn't. I still don't believe that he knows Jesus after this. But Jesus presented him with a gift and it's up to him to accept it. So today, you know, my message might have been a little short, but this passage is about mercy and grace from the Father. Because Jesus not only goes to this place to seek this guy out, but it's also the start of his persecution. It's the start of the people wanting to kill him. And from now on, Jesus will be persecuted until they put him on the cross. And it's that persecution that puts him on the cross, right? It's them seeking out because he is claiming himself to be equal with the Father. So I find this passage all about Jesus. All about Jesus seeking for us, looking for us, chasing after us because of the love and the grace and the mercy that he has for us. Today this man was, this man was healed from an infirmity, but the most important part was Jesus coming back and saying, I want to spend eternity with you. And today, I don't know if where you all are at, but today is a day that you should think about that. I want to spend eternity with him. I don't want to wait anymore. I'm tired of this old mat. It's nasty, it's dirty, it's filthy. And I'm ready to lay it down and just chase after God.
Father God, we just thank you for this day, Father. Father, we just thank you for your Son, for chasing after us, for his love, for his grace, for going to the cross uh, so that my shame could be taken away, Father. Father, for just carrying that load for me. Father, for the, the sins that he bore so that I could be forgiven, that I could be set free, Father. So today, Father, I just pray for that one today that is just, uh, God, that just doesn't know you, that's struggling, that's uh, just picked something up and just cannot find a way to, to release themselves from it, Father. Today, we just call on you to do that for us, God. God, we just love you and we just thank you for what you're doing, what you're doing in our lives, and, and uh, you simply are amazing. It's in Jesus' name that I Need to get your hymnal out. <laughs> <coughs> 